the slight delay, I think we should get started. Um, thank you very, very much for coming this evening um, for the panel discussion for Can Buildings Curate, um, which opened last, uh, last Thursday. My name is uh, Shimon Basar. I'm a co-curator, um, along with uh, Joshua Volkover and Parag Sharma of the, uh, of the exhibition. I also teach here at the AA, um, and, um, and it's with great pleasure that I'm able to welcome our four panelists um, this evening. Um, perhaps um, just to move straight into, straight into things. Um, I'd like to welcome um, on my right here Jens Hoffman who is uh, Director of Exhibitions at the ICA in London. Um, Jens has organized and or curated uh, the exhibitions Artists' Favorites, 100, 100 Artists See God, and most recently, the Tino Segal Show. Prior to his appointment at the ICA, Jens worked as a freelance curator. One of his best known projects, the next documenta should be curated by an artist, began online at eFlux and was recently published as a book. To my uh, left, I have David uh, Badoki. Um, David is an artist based uh, between Milan and, uh, and Paris. In March of this year, David had a solo show at the Palais de Tokyo um, called uh, Top 100, uh, the second part of which he aired at uh, the Apple in Amsterdam uh, this weekend. Two of his speculative animations for what he calls utopic spaces, um, uh, which are titled Limo and uh, Autumn and Progresso, are presented in the exhibition next door. Um, as you go in and turn immediately to your right on the box, there are the two monitors. Um, one on the left, uh, the, the, this piece here, Limo, and on the right, a piece based, um, a fictional piece based around uh, uh, Niemeyer's uh, Niteroi Museum uh, in Sao Paulo. Um, Limo was previously shown at the Centre Pompidou in 2004, whilst we're pleased uh, to present Autumn and Progresso for the first time here at the AA. To my, uh, to my le far left is Christian Tecker. Christian is one third of uh, Berlin um, architectural office as if. In 2004, their design for the Gallery for Contemporary Art in Leipzig opened to much critical acclaim. In collaboration with the curator Barbara Steiner, the GFZK is presented in the exhibition next door as a contemporary case study in the art of architectural curation, one that harnesses shifts uh, shifting partitions to create different stage sets for each exhibition. Um, this is something we will no doubt talk about later this evening. Um, and finally, on my right, I'm very, um, very happy to welcome Sarah Herder. Sarah is the director of the fiercely independent storefront for art and architecture in New York. Uh, many of you will know this, uh, this building and know this institution. Since 1982, the storefront has been a unique site for experimental architecture. It's been promoting original research and design with a raw, rawness not found in most large-scale art institutions. Its current home was dreamt up by artist Vita Conchi and New York architect Stephen Hall. Diminutive and unlike any other art space in the world, the storefront's dynamic, porous facade has now been an idiosyncratic venue to curate and program for nearly 15 years now. Sarah, how long have you? Nearly 25. Nearly 25, my maths. I've terrible. been there seven. Sarah's been there seven and... Um, Sarah's aging much better than the building. <laughs> um, okay, as, um, as a preface to the, uh, to the discussion this evening, which I hope will take no longer than 45 minutes, um, I thought it would be, it would be good maybe um, to set out some of the kind of curatorial imperatives um, and reasoning behind the show as a whole, um, and then to move on um, to a series of discussions um, uh, between our panelists. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read slightly, um, uh, and hopefully uh, it'll, it'll be crystal clear. It's our reckoning that, since the late 1960s, the dominance of certain... Oops, I'm sorry, I should have done this before. That's the GFZK by Kristen Teckert, and that's the storefront for art and architecture in New York. Um, okay, it's our reckoning that, since the late 1960s, the dominance of a certain paradigm in gallery settings, one constructed around the myth of neutrality, has triumphed. Like market capitalism, it seems that the cool, achromatic, bleached gallery backdrop is synonymous with a globalized idea of contemporary art. It has become a terminal endpoint. We would also proffer that this terminal condition has induced amnesia, one that disregards the potentially instrumental role of the gallery in the relationship between artistic, curatorial, and architectural production. In the exhibition, through flashbacks to early provocateurs, 
some of whom are presented, such as Marcel Duchamp and Frédéric Kiesler on your left as you come in, or Lino Bobardi around the cube. Uh, some who are, uh, who are spiritually present um, but visually missing, such as Alexander Dorner or Herbert Baer uh, at laboratory years at MoMA. Um, we hope to stimulate anti-amnesia, and we hope to draw links uh, between the distant past and contemporary practices. It's a tautology, I believe, but it's true that buildings always do contribute to curation of works. The question is, to what extent have they, do they, and could they participate further in the cycles of art conception and execution, and indeed within the art world as a whole? What is the relationship between pretty dumb facts of walls, floors, and ceilings with cultural production? To what extent is the sustaining of certain kinds of architectural paradigms an ideological, economic, or aesthetic function, or indeed a fetish? All that is good and fine. But the most controversy we've come across in preparing this exhibition has been the absence of the question mark in the title. It has offended, it has bemused, and more often the question mark returns from being repressed courtesy of copy, copy editors of various publications. A friend of mine in New York told me he liked the fact that there wasn't a question mark. To which I asked him, why is that the case? He replied, why do I like the absence of the question mark? Something a girl, woo-hoo, just wrote to me illuminates it. What are you doing to me? That's pretty fucking cool, and makes me like her more, see? And the effect would be the same with an exhibition. I think the absence of the question mark uncovers the truth of the phoniness of the question. Does that make sense? It says it's a question that really isn't a question. The absence says, well, duh. As, uh, as a way to navigate through this evening, I thought what would be best would be uh, to establish a set of false questions. They're false because perhaps they're rhetorical. They're false perhaps because they, they might set up false binaries that aren't binaries at all. So, to get things going, the first of these false questions, Modern, with a capital M, or modern? Does the revisionist design of Taniguchi's MoMA in New York that's recently reopened mean anything more than MoMA's necessity to theme park the modern? Or should we see it in the same light as the Whitney and LACMA getting cold feet with the architect Rem Callhaus and choosing to go safe with Renzo Piano? To what extent is the recent hegemony of retro early modernism endemic and if so, should we worry about it more than we worry about what's new in El Decoracio? Um, Sarah the, the earlier asked me not to ask her about MoMA, but I'm going to ignore her request, <laughs> even though I probably know her, 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 her stock response, but given uh, she is the native New Yorker here, um, could you perhaps put the, the reopening of MoMA in context? Um, and does it matter, does it really matter what the galleries look like within MoMA? Well, what, well, I was thinking about that you sent these uh, questions to us beforehand. Um, and, and for me, in the context of this show, I'm going to kind of derail your question a little bit, is that I don't, for me, it's kind of an issue of scale. Like when, what I think, the, the, the things that you're looking at in terms of models, uh, whether they're the ones that go through, like Mo, Taniguchi's MoMA, or uh, the ones that evaporate, like LACMA, and Whitney, I mean, that's happening at a completely different scale than maybe the exhibition here. Mm -hmm. And so that I think it's actually much more interesting to look at these other scales that may, I mean, I think maybe it's too late in a way for MoMA to change MoMA. I mean, to, that a lot of people have been critical that the architecture wasn't more adventurous, um, that they took no risks, and well, they didn't take risks. They kind of knew what they wanted, and they got it. And I think it serves that purpose. I think that having expectations for an institution like that to take um, the risk that maybe we all want to see mm -hmm. in the projects, you know, any number of projects, uh, I think maybe it's more useful to focus, well, I don't know, I won't, I won't put a value on it, but I think there, there is a scale where you really can achieve change. And I think that looking at what we do at, at Storefront is a very small, raw space, but you can, you can transform it, you can take it over. And I think that because the investment, maybe, we, you know, maybe because we have no money, you, you're willing to, to put everything into everything that you do. 
So you take risks in every action that you make. And I don't know how that necessarily will translate for maybe a, a younger generation. Like, if, we, we, if do, in doing this, we'll change institutions later. Because right now, it's not only, I mean, you're looking at the boards, you're looking at all, it's the buildings, it's the artists, the curators, but maybe more than that, it's also the board of directors, the, the other funders, the audience, as equations in, in why MoMA probably looks like MoMA. But perhaps I just want to bring up, there's a, a, an excellent book called The Power of Display by mm -hmm. Marianne Stagnowski, um, which is a survey of what she calls the laboratory of years of exhibition design mm -hmm. um, at MoMA, um, mm -hmm. particularly under the directorship of, 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 uh, of Herbert Bayer. And, um, and that book is a kind of extraordinary chronicle of, uh, of brave, radical mm -hmm. kind of statements, um, whether they were designed by Philip Johnson, whether they were designed by Paul Rudolph throughout the 50s and the 60s. There's a, there's a degree, I guess, of, of sort of beacon-like pioneer, pioneering work being done during that period mm -hmm. that uh, I certainly find difficult to, find, to, to see parallels in, uh, in the MoMA's uh, behavior in the last mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years even. Um, and I suppose one's question would be um, the, the sort of unveiling then of, of the White Palace. Um, is, that, is that just, is that the sort of nail in the coffin for the MoMA as a kind of progressive institution as opposed to one that looks merely at its own retrospective history. But perhaps I could ask, I mean, I'm interested to ask uh, Christian, as, a, as an architect, how you responded. I, I, I have to put, hold my hands, I've not been there. So I'm making all my, uh, my, uh, my generalizations and sweeping statements uh, on, on the basis of photography. But indeed, when don't we do that anymore? But as an architect, how do you respond? respond to the moment, the opening of the moment? Well, at first, I, I must admit, uh, I also wasn't there, <laughs> so my knowledge is basically also from photographs, but uh, I've been to other museums from Taniguchi, so I got a slight idea of what it will look like, I would guess, but uh, I think uh, it's really a question of scale, uh, very much like Sarah Herda mentioned, uh, like uh, the MoMA in, in what it means today and what, what it has become. It has reached su such a, I would say, critical mass that it's so much really about numbers, about quantity, about being present on a uh, level of image policy towards tourism, towards uh, being a, an important landmark in the city. Uh, that, it's, that of course it becomes more and more difficult to take risks and there is so much pressure from a, like a commercial side, but also like from maybe the board uh, as it maybe mm, it might be not the most progressive board that you could imagine, so things uh, I think automatically build up and 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 go into one direction, and it's much easier uh, for an institution at the beginning or after a certain uh, break in its own history to try out new things, new strategies, develop a provocative uh, means of of display and representation. I think that that it was possible in a time when uh, what you were talking about, uh, these progressive years, they were in mostly in the, between the 30s and 50s. And this was a time when, when the whole uh, museum, as a, the disposition of the museum itself, what it should be, what it should become, was quite uh, an open question, I would guess. And David, as, a, as an artist, how do you react to the kind of um, repetition or the resuscitation of the, of the modern um, as the gallery space? Um, well, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Christian in a way because I also, I also do think that, like, if I continued my metaphor with the museum and cars, which I did in Guggenheim and Limo, and I would think of MoMA and Mercedes, for example, I would think the Mercedes would never take a risk and make a, like, a weird car, or, I mean, it's like really super stable and it's for the audience to reassure them, you know, to have a nice place where there's a lot of marketing going on. And yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, I don't know if it's, it's really a matter of art and it's not a matter of presentation anymore. So mm -hmm. It's a matter of giving like a certain image and, uh, and I guess it's also connected to the social and the political situation of the US at the moment, I guess, which goes towards stability in a way. I mean, so, Jens, how do you No, no, I, <coughs> I would definitely agree to what uh, David just said. It's probably very much a 
kind of mirror what happens in the U.S. right now in terms of new conservatism. But um, when I went to uh, MoMA and looking at the galleries there, which are obviously, of course, following this uh, universal model of the white cube, the supposedly neutral exhibition space, um, I was actually not so much shocked by, by the building itself or surprised by the building itself, but rather by what I saw in there, which was the, um, the way the, the collection was displayed and particularly what, um, how the, the collection of contemporary art is displayed in there which kind of brought me more to the question of how can we actually um, collect contemporary art and how much can that actually still have a place within an architecture like that. But would you agree then perhaps that um, the, the look that, uh, that, that MoMA spent I don't know, close to a billion dollars yeah, on yeah. Um, is, uh, I don't know, is as fashionable as... Um, I don't know, hippie chic and, uh, and cowboy boots, do you think? Um, <laughs> no, because I, th I think this point about, I mean, a lot has been said about the kind of, uh, the, uh, the sort of um, outlook of confidence post 9-11 and, and its impact, let's say, on sort of cultural production, or a certain kind of initial reservedness, let's say. Um, I mean, sorry, what were you going to say? I just, I don't think it's actually an issue of fashionable at all. I mean, I think that the MoMA, I mean, I think it, in a way it's realized the way it's, its relationship to art, I mean, that it's, that it's had for a while. It's not necessarily a place where you're, you're ex I mean, contemporary art is, has an uneasy home in MoMA, and I would say that it has for a while. That it's, um, I don't know that it's necessarily, a, you know, recent conservatism in the United States. I think it's more, I mean, I went to the National Gallery mm -hmm. here today. I mean, it's more of the, the institutionalization of an institution, like this, this life cycle of an institution. I mean, I think about that at Storefronts 25, I don't know, ICA is what? 50. I mean, so there's things that, I mean, at certain scales, maybe if it's really intrinsic to the mission, you're, you're constantly changes the mission, so you always have to be new. I mean, at one point, obviously, MoMA had to grapple with that, and maybe in doing this project, it could have gone two ways or it could have gone many number of ways. And it, it, it became more of the institution that, that it was. I mean, that, you know, maybe the, the relationship with something like PS1 was, a, um, was a, an attempt to have a connection mm -hmm. to the truly contemporary. But for me, it's less, like, it's more of a function of the, of the institution, like, and its relationship to art. Okay. Jens? Um, maybe uh, to follow on from that, um, one cliche that rings uh, <laughs> true whenever one talks about uh, the gallery is that eccentric architecture deafens the viewer to seeing and hearing the art. Um, next door we've got um, a, a couple of images that um, kind of reminding, uh, trying to remind us of Lino Bavardi's kind of amazingly heroic gesture in Sao Paulo, the, the MASP. Um, and in particular, the, uh, the room, the Pinacoteca, um, in which she, um, she sort of arranged this uh, 18th, uh, 18th and 19th century uh, painting collections um, in this incredibly brave kind of disposition on glass planes, making the whole thing look like some sort of magician's trick. Um, it was considered uh, too loud. It was taken down. It's never been put back up again. Um, the, the Bilbao effect, a lot of which was discussed during the 90s, uh, one, would argue, one could argue, was an effect that happened which allowed the architect freedom, gesturality, but pre pretty much on the outside of buildings. Um, when one looked at the inside of buildings, um, particularly the gallery spaces such as Tate Modern, for example, one saw the same, as it were. Um, is there really a contest um, between, uh, between uh, the art and the architecture? And if so, should the artist always win, David? Hmm. Well, I don't know if it's a real contest. I mean, it's um, it's uh, it's more like a I, I don't see it as a kind of war, like a fight. I see it more like a reciprocal exchange in a way. And uh, you know, there are uh, there are I think museum and places that make artists feel really shy. You know, and and for me, it's important that artists are not shy. 
in a while they get that building like they don't get like scared like wow look at them <coughs> what, what can I do or for me it's more like a challenge mm -hmm. so uh, in, in a way I respond to that uh, signal which is the structure of the museum and yeah I just see it like a challenge in a way Jens I just wondered whether um, one thing that one could claim is that during the 90s there's, we've seen the rise of the, of the curator from um, from uh, from someone who uh, perhaps was once I mean one one thinks of the Royal College course, which is visual arts administration, for example. Um, so there seems to be a sort of like explosion of curation and curators during the nineties, and of course there's the there's a there's a rather uh, um, crude labelling of the star curator, which I think, but is also undeniable. Um, but it seems to me that a, a new star has been born. Um, is that uh, is that something that you would um, you would uh, you would agree with? Is there is there a, a thing such as star envy from curators, or are artists still, as far as you're concerned, from your curatorial point of view, at the apex of that triangle? Well, I think who is on the apex of that <coughs> triangle is whoever um, gives us, the artists and the curators, the possibilities to actually do the exhibitions that we want to do, which is mainly the sponsors or whoever gives us the money to do that. Um, I think that I would rather talk about the sort of aesthetic, aesthetic alliance that we have with artists once we produce exhibitions. But I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of the idea of the star curator and um, this whole idea of how curatorial concepts um, overshadow um, the artistic contributions to certain exhibitions, which mainly uh, maybe is similar to what you have said about um, the, the overshadowing of, of architecture. Uh, but I think there's, there's a misunderstanding here. Um, um, I mean, from my point of view, for me personally, the collaboration and the, the exchange of, of, uh, with, with artists has always been key to all of the curatorial projects that I've been uh, doing and um, the project that you presented in the beginning um, goes very much along that lines. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that there is a sort of conflict between um, the artists and the curators to that degree. Mm -hmm. And Christian, as an, as an architect who's recently finished a, a, an art space, where do you position yourself and your practice in this kind of spectrum from, from so-called loud to so-called quiet? And the, was it an issue very much for you? Mm, it was very much an issue, I guess, because uh, you have to deal with it on each level, like from from, um, from the general appearance, when, when thinking about the, the whole representational uh, facade, uh, how do you approach a building, uh, what does it say to you, is it representative, is it somehow uh, fancy, uh, what is the difference between outside and inside? Uh, how are the spaces configured? Are they made like for the usual setting of a well, white cube after white cube and uh, supposedly most neutral, which of course it, it isn't as we know. But uh, of course uh, you think about it all the time un until the last detail, uh, like where, where the, uh, the uh, electricity is or where the power plugs are situated and so on. All the, these things are questions that sort of uh, very much uh, define the, I don't know, presence of architecture as such. And I guess we've chosen a way, deliberately chosen a way um, to be quite present, to give uh, artists or let's say maybe uh, certain artists' practices uh, a certain challenge but also a certain instrument that they could work with. So it's sort of a, like, preconceiving situations uh, and having in mind working situation processes and thinking about how certain artists or artist groups or curators could, might respond or take up some, uh, some elements that are here to work with. I think that's uh, maybe a lot, of, uh, a lot about uh, understanding contemporary art practices but also taking a certain position because you cannot satisfy uh, each ideology concerned with uh, art, even if it's contemporary art, we cannot really say that this is the state of art today, of contemporary art. So uh, it was clear that um, we wanted to and had to take a certain position. And of course it's very much about, uh, especially this building is very much about art practices, 
also like Jens Hoffmann said, uh, or at least that's w what I heard out of it, uh, that of course the uh, artists and curatorial uh, practices and desires sort of uh, merge more and more. There's more communication, but they get nearer to it, each other also. So it's uh, sort of, uh, in a lot of cases, a very parallel uh, applied strategy. And we often see curators uh, going very much into the strategies of artists and vice versa. We see a lot of artists also curating. Mm -hmm. So I guess on, on this uh, side, uh, we already have in certain areas uh, quite good understanding of what the needs could be and also what, what new challenges could be or what a new sort of uh, critical dealing with space or the whole institutional setting might be. I guess that's maybe a special topic in, in architecture, but I, th I think it's more or less really a matter of uh, understanding and knowledge transfer. Sorry, you're, I mean, I have to say, if I'm gonna take my clothes off, I, you know, I find, I, I, I think this, this issue is, is really under sort of plagued um, because often, I mean, we were recently visiting a, a small gallery in, in East London um, with the prospect of sort of doing something to it and we were told how the fact that there were plug points on that, plug sockets on that wall horrified a number of painters. Mm. Um, personally, I find that incredibly prima donna-ish sort of behaviour, which, you know, I know there are, there's a, there are reasons for it and so on and so forth, but it seems to me that, um, you know, that's a sort of microcosm of a, of a much bigger, bigger, bigger sort of issue, uh, where it seems to me that the, uh, it comes down to the sort of issue of, uh, of sort of legibility, you know, the, of, the, of the sort of legibility of art as, obviously, as, as primacy within the kind of aesthetic experience. Um, am I overreacting? No, but I think it's within different, like, you know, that, that's a, I'm assuming is a private commercial gallery. Sure. It's dealing with the market, it's, so therefore it's dealing with the, the optimal display. I mean, so it's like a, in a lot of ways, I don't, I don't necessarily think that, would, also when you're talking about curation, I think of curation happening more in public institutions or, you know, the kind of, mm -hmm. at, at, all, at all kinds of different scales. I mean, whether it's something more established or a, a new alternative space where it's more about what you're going to do in that space opposed to what you're... I think it's a lot of it has to do with the kind of art that you're dealing with. I mean, are you dealing with more traditional forms like painting, drawings, um, and maybe even to some extent kinds of installation work that's being produced that's sort of more commercially acceptable. I mean, I think, you know, at MoMA, if you look at what you're hanging, I mean, to me, there's not such a disconnect between what, what, what the space that they created and the way they're displaying it. I think that maybe, again, it's more the organization of the institution. And if you're fundamentally trying to change that institution, which I think things like, I mean, LACMA mm -hmm. was, it's very funny, I just read their press release from when they announced that the, the partnership with Rem Pool House. I mean, it was like, a, a, they were trying to take on um, the institution itself, and also with the Whitney, not to use another um, REM reference, but, you know, Anderson, is it Anderson? Maxwell Anderson. Maxwell Anderson left because he said he was disappointed that the board didn't want to take a, a bigger step, like they didn't want to take more risk and really change the institution. So I think that you probably could change this, the, the institution of a commercial gallery mm -hmm. if someone wanted to, but they have to be willing I think to take the risk and, and, and be interested in changing um, the way they work or function. No, I understand. Uh, Jens, I just want to remind you of a conversation we had a, a couple of months ago where you pointed out that you know, within, the, within the, the art system, as it were, that you know, we're, we're obviously at a historical point where, our, to quote you, artists produce works for the modern white space. You know, they have that in anticipation, um, and so there's a kind of teleology between the production, and even before the thing is done, there's a sense in which its space of display, possibly even commerce, is, is kind of given. The implication for me there is that it, it becomes a sort of self-perpetuating system, and that's what I suppose I mean by a sort of terminal end point. Um, would you agree with that? And if so, is that 
something that one should worry well, about? Well, I guess different types of art require different spaces for exhibiting mm -hmm. the work, but somehow everybody <coughs> seems to agree that the white cube is the space that everyone somehow more or less can agree on. And um, that has led to a situation where obviously what you know, we were discussing uh, is a result where you know, most artists actually produce work that can be exhibited within that um, context. But obviously, of course, we have also artists who try to break out of it, as we have seen it again and again. And I mean, you have like beautiful historic examples of this uh, in there. And I think also in terms of the responsibility of curators and institutions, it is very much to, to um, offer the artists the possibility to break out of it and try you know, various other possibilities of presenting the, mm -hmm. their artwork. And I think the exhibition that the ICA has recently done, which I hope most of you have seen um, with John Bock, was one example of you know, turning the white cube completely upside down and from left to right and right to left. Um, so I, I still think there, there, there are many possibilities, but I would certainly agree that there are <coughs> a number of conditions that inform um, how you know, art is, is presented. But in <coughs> originally when I um, read um, only, or when you emailed me, I said, um, can buildings curate and the implications of building on uh, curatorial practice? I was also thinking, obviously, if, if, if budgets can curate or whatever conditions you basically have that is somehow um, determining what you are doing or somehow conditioning what you are doing. And um, I think that uh, within my curatorial understanding, the, you know, the space itself plays one particular role, but it's just one among, you know, many other considerations. So I wouldn't put so much emphasis on all of that as you do, uh, and particularly when looking at some of the examples that you have in, in the exhibition, I rather sort of talk about them in terms of exhibition design as, you know, rather less than, than talking about them in, in terms of architecture. Mm -hmm. um, just to, to continue that point uh, about uh, the sort of uh, yeah, the curatorial responsibility perhaps of, of certain spaces, um, site specific art reacts to the conditions of its surroundings by becoming a product of it. Think of Guggenheim in New York or Jenny Holtz's piece at the Neue National Gallery and of course Kapoor and Eliasson at the Turbine Hall. When being conceived either by an architect or the curator who is commissioning a new art space, should the co-author midwife role of the gallery for its future artists be taken into account? If so, how? Um, Sarah, would you like to respond to that at all? I mean, in, in a way, it's, it, um, it's saying that, as, as Jens points out, it, it, it's, it, well, it's a legitimate, it is but one part, but nevertheless, uh, an, I would argue, an important part, particularly with the advent of site-specific kind of work, um, that that kind of co-authored uh, role of the, of, of the gallery be taken into account in the, in the conception and the execution of new kind of gallery spaces. Would you agree with me on that? Well, I mean, I think from my experience at Storefront, I mean, I'm working with this space that has such specific conditions, not only its floor plan, which is this, you know, three feet wide at one end, 15 at the other, and 100 feet long, but then this very dominant project, the Vito Conti Stephen Hall. So I think it's interesting to, to imagine how you can, or how you can achieve maximum difference in a space that's so particular. I mean, they, and I think that to some extent we've managed to do that at Storefront, but when, you, when I think about new, new architecture projects or new spaces mm -hmm. for art. To me, that seems to be um, probably one of the biggest issues because you don't want, I, I remember being on a, on a, um, a panel to choose artists for a, a, a studio program in the Woolworth building. So all the buildings, or all the projects, the proposals, they wanted everything to be about the Woolworth building. Mm -hmm. How interesting is it to have a hundred projects by artists on the world with building, unless it's a phenomena happening outside on its own, and then maybe it's interesting to look at, but to kind of force people to react to, I just think that there's also kind of a danger in it, um, that it doesn't, doesn't make me conservative all, at all in saying that I would go to the white cube, but I, I just think that it's an interesting dilemma with, uh, with very specific kinds of architecture and how artists can work with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Turbine Hall, 
is a great, I mean, you have these kind of, I can imagine it with these found spaces, like storefront wasn't this kind of a found space, and the turbine hall is kind of this found, recovered space. Um, I think I have a harder time imagining what it will be in a new space. Davide, sorry, um, I just want to remind people of uh, the two pieces that Davide uh, is showing, um, in a way, picks two of the kind of goliaths of, of sort of eccentric, um, Overpowering Albury spaces, the, the, and both uh, both the Niteroi and the Guggenheim in New York, uh, I, and I know from your from our discussions, are also there's a sort of idea of the kind of endlessness, of the sort of circularity of these spaces. Both the limo, which uh, those of you who haven't seen but saw the image, uh, fits uh, exactly within the curvature of, of the uh, of the Guggenheim, and indeed the uh, the rolling sphere from the Brazilian flag in uh, Ordem and Progresso sort of seemed to me to take this co-authoring of the gallery space to a kind of absurd limit, which uh, is a weird thing that unweirds the weird, as it were. I mean, uh, for you, are these spaces, are these, um, is this kind of the only way to overcome the eccentricity of these spaces? Um, well, for me, it's, it's the only way, in a way, but because I, I, I do think that, I mean, I see those, like, basically like artwork itself, for example, like huge sculpture, or I mean, this is my view on this museum. So for me, it's the architect who made the artwork, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in a way, it's uh, I just see it as a sort of form generator. So from that form, I, I try and think something that would just belong to the same logic of that particular place. Therefore, it, it, it is kind of fitting the logic, and therefore, as you're saying, it makes the weird and weird. I mean, it just fits together, so it's. It's kind of uh, unique, let's say, mm -hmm. and it becomes like a sort of uh, uh, solar system in a way, where this this own gravitational energy inside the two things. So I do see like my, my animation like a bit of a sort of machine, a bit like uh, Duchamp, uh, mm -hmm. chocolate grinder, you know, like this kind of idea of, of consuming energy, uh, useless and without utility. So yeah, it for me, it it's the only way of reacting. In fact. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to come back to this question um, on site specificity, because uh, I think what is quite interesting about uh, what this, these site specific uh, projects that were quite a big topic in the 90s have shown was uh, that it's not about maybe uh, a certain well, architecturally designed space where the meaning is located, but that it's about uh, sort of excavating the layers of, of meaning and production of meaning that are present at the place and or let's say as a si on a site because this English term site it has a more precise uh, meaning in terms of a space that is defined through a process or a certain layers of meaning and uh, we saw in these uh, approaches that there are really a number of layers that are extremely important um, for uh, let's say uh, power structures at work, hidden meanings, ideologies that can be addressed and excavated. And uh, architecture or the meaning of a certain architectural design is just one of them. So that's also a point, I think, where the role uh, of architecture as an author or co-author should also not be overestimated because the system, uh, or, or the, let's say the the platform that architecture can give can only be as good as, as it is taken over by the institution and the powers that work in, in the institution and the processes in which the institution works. So we also saw a lot of uh, architectural projects that were quite interesting and progressive uh, from an architect side. Let's say, for example, the Kunsthalle in uh, Rotterdam by Rem Kohlhaas, uh, where we see a really sad way it is treated or like a quite banal way the, the exhibitions uh, happen there or quite banal topics uh, going on and and therefore I think it's it's really bad for, for both sides because uh, this, this sort of architecture only makes uh, really sense when you when, when the whole exhibition setting and the whole institution especially is really willing to work with it and exploit its layers it um, um, the architecture uh, produces. 
And uh, if that does not happen, um, well, the most progress progressive or complex uh, architectural setting won't have any big meaning, I guess. In a way, that goes back to your point, doesn't it, Jens, that uh, one can only see it as part of a kind of meta structure of which, uh, let's say, an, for lack of a better term, an eccentric space can only really truly work to its full maximum potential if it has a kind of a eccentric institutional sort of physique running it. Would you would you agree with that? I don't really know what you mean with eccentric mm -hmm. in that respect. Um, something incredibly singular uh, and uh, like the Guggenheim in New York, like the Nimes in Detroit, to some extent the Turtle in Hot Four, um, spaces which are, um, you know, kind of authorially loud, um, at a point where, you know, one can imagine Frank Lloyd Wright really not giving a shit whether, you know, whether the painting was at an angle to the, to the floor. I mean, there, there's a sort of bravura there that, that, of course, is generated through a kind of cult of architectural personality, which produces what I would call eccentric spaces. Um, there are probably also different level of, of eccentricity. Um, so maybe some um, spaces work better than others. And um, of course, there are probably also very extreme examples. And you probably know this much better than I do, um, what kind of extreme examples there are. Maybe in the, the, the Guggenheim Museum that was planned in, in for Taiwan, which you, you were talking mm -hmm. about before, which looked to me extremely extreme, <laughs> eccentric, yeah. where it seemed to be almost impossible to actually present any, any artworks. Um, so that just in terms of, of, of um, but recently we, I, I, I'm, I'm doing a seminar with, with students from the curatorial course uh, at Goldsmiths College, um, which sort of runs under the heading of the ideal institution. And one of the aspects that we were also looking at was to think about the ideal architecture for a space. And, and I kind of started to realize that I'm kind of in a luxurious position with the ICAs, having these spaces given to me and having to deal with it. Because I wouldn't actually be able to tell you if you would come up to me and tell me, okay, we're going to build a new purpose build building mm -hmm. for contemporary art. How to actually do that? Because I, I, I wouldn't know how how to to have that building exist with, with for, for you know the, the the near future even, and how to predict in, in which directions we are we are going, and and also obviously with the aim of of breaking out of this conditioning that I was trying to describe try, um, describe before. I find it an extremely in, an interesting but also difficult uh, thing to think about. But actually, that's what I, I mean, I, a sort of point I wanted to ask, uh, mainly the, the two of you as, as sort of curators of, of, of spaces, whether, um, I mean, you've acted as, a, as an independent curator, so you've worked um, at the extreme of kind of colonizing various kinds of spaces on a, on a sort of ad hoc Basis, and you're working with a with a singular. Well, you're both now working with singular spaces on a sort of repetitive basis, and hopefully trying to find imaginative new strategies of, of colonizing. They're both extremely different. It seems to me there's a there's a sort of uh, quasi regal um, institutional stature to the, to the to the ICA, whereas yours is very much a sort of bold statement. It seems to me very much, as you said earlier, uh, a, a very clear statement between a, a country and. and and whole. At which point does um, does a, a, a space stop allowing you freedom and just simply become frustrated? Uh, have you ever been frustrated with? Uh, I mean, more space? more than me are the people who show at Tour yeah. I mean, there's this typical. Well, there are a few of them here who have all wanted to, that showed at storefront That the, the 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 first impulse is to destroy it. Mm -hmm. The Akanchi and Hall. Everybody wants to. They want to take the doors out. They want to. They want to. You know. They want to change the whole facade. They want to rip holes in the floor. They want to, I mean, there's, they want to take it over and transform it. And it's kind of the first step. And it, it's, it's a, I think, a very important process of, of working there because it's, we're working with this, maybe this contemporary architectural icon, but we don't, we're not, it's not very precious mm -hmm. to us. I mean, there's so many people that come to the space and don't even know what we do. They think that it's a store that Stephen Hall designed. And so, I think there's you, you're dealing with different kinds of, of, of ideas about the space or understanding of the space, but I think it's, it's incredibly frustrating to mm -hmm. people. And, and it, it also performs kind of beyond its formal um, 
actuality. Like it's, I have problems with the Akanchi Hall project at times, but I can't deny that it performs beyond any other project I can imagine commissioning. Mm -hmm. Like if we were the idea, you know, the idea that this was going to be a, a temporary project that was going to change every two years, and I would never take at, at this point in the institution's like its storefront's life. I don't think we've outlived the possibilities of that project. And I agree with you. I can't imagine, in a way what the new space is, like what creating a new space for art. And I think it's interesting with a lot of your historical precedents is that I think a lot of those people really truly believed and were trying to figure out a new way to deal with art, whether it's historical work as in Lena Bobardi's case or new work in, in, in Kiesler or, or Duchamp. And so I think that that to me seems like the real opportunity is these kind of collaborations at, this, at a much smaller scale in trying to figure out you know, maybe it's my sort of optimistic trait, like what are the new ways But you, you do believe, it? or you do believe there's a necessity to hope or look for the new ways? Yeah, I think that, we, I think that you're, you're dealing with that all the time if you're working in, in, in contemporary art. If you're mm -hmm. working with working artists, mm -hmm. and I think maybe if you're working outside of, especially maybe outside of a commercial system, where you have the kind of luxury to not deal with what sells, I think that's, with the, with the work, the people that we work with, I mean, then the kind of maybe the, tip, the slant of what we do, but yeah, I, I'm completely optimistic that there must be new ways, and that but they all start here, and then they'll maybe get more institutionalized. I don't know that. I think it's maybe too optimistic to think that an institution like MoMA is going to lead the way. I think it's going to whatever we're doing now is going to lead to new institutions. It's a kind of inevitability. Maybe. Institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe Jens, just quickly, have you do you ever find being frustrated is a kind of freedom? Uh, in terms of the sort of spaces that you've been, uh, you've had to deal with, um, both as an independent curator and now with the, with the ICA. I mean, uh, the ICA is a very particular um, kind of setting uh, in, in one way. How has that transition worked for you, kind of going from independent curator to uh, uh, now having to deal with this fixed, this fixed space? Well, <coughs> as you said before, I didn't have really have one particular gallery in which I was working, so I was, you know, having to adapt to various different galleries or, you know, also something that we shouldn't forget, of course, that there's a lot of art that is produced that is outside of the, the gallery space and it doesn't actually need the gallery space. Um, but now at the ICA, obviously, um, the conditions are that we have these two very disconnected spaces and somehow I'm trying to figure out how to... Uh, you know, from exhibition to exhibition, from artist to artist, how to, to uh, create a relationship between these two spaces. Often we ran into the problem that the upstairs gallery just became an annex of what had actually happened in the downstairs gallery, which um, I, I wasn't particularly happy about, but it remains an investigation and a, and a research in a way. But are you both telling me that if you were uh, handed a, a blank check now and told, um, okay, you get what you want, you wouldn't know what you want. I wouldn't know immediately, but of course I wouldn't give up. <laughs> you I mean, wouldn't hand the check back. No, no. I'd okay. hire a good architect. The <laughs> 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 You'd hire an architect. I'd hire a good architect. <laughs> <laughs> good architects you have there. Okay. Um, is, um, is institutional critique through the anatomy of the gallery museum a thing of the past? since its techniques have already been co-opted by the institution of the art world or art market. Um, are someone like Elm Green and Dragset doing more than just a karaoke version of Michael Asher 30 years on, with worse tunes and less urgent necessity? Um, I suppose it, it sort of follows on your point that uh, every, uh, it's a sort of truism, isn't it, that every, uh, every form of so-called radical cultural uh, activity at some point gets co-opted and uh, warmly embraced by kind of uh, institutional um, big brother. Um, Jens, um, the, do you still find that there is a kind of um, uh, vital or, or vibrant kind of uh, practice within the art world today that one could put within the trajectory of institutional critique or is that uh, within which specifically let's say the, physic the physicality of the institution, be it the gallery or the museum, 
is at the fore, but do you think that's also just something that's gone the way of sort of 50s macho tainting? You know, we can consign to history. Well, I think that is certainly institutional critique, the way it was articulated in the 60s and 70s, um, maybe also in the 80s, isn't that what you, what, what um, contemporary or younger artists are necessarily involved with. I mean, Michael Emgren and Linda Graz are a good example of artists who have taken on board a lot of those issues, but then also uh, are moving into different directions. Um, I mean, the, the, the um, project that they presented here at Tate Modern was in a way a very playful take on institutional critique where they put this little bird within the, the in-between space of the window of this untitled space, which is a project space there at Tate Modern. I think um, as a reaction to the monumentality and sensationalism of what the Turban Hall uh, uh, was presenting at that point, or had just presented, which was this uh, project by Olaf Eliasson. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's still a certain critique towards the uh, institution uh, to be found in the work of many younger artists, but um, definitely in a very different um, mm -hmm. you know, way than it used to be. Davide, as, a, as an artist, has this, um, has this ever kind of interested you? And are your works um, uh, in the gallery, are they in any way a kind of critique of institutions, or are they operating at a different level? I mean, I guess you could see as a critique, but it's um, it's kind of friendly critique. It's like cohabitating or just like sort of more than critique. It's more like inviting myself <laughs> to do something at the Google and more <laughs> or other. <laughs> and it's like kind of squatting. You know, uh -huh. like, I mean, it could be a critique because I don't know. But I always think. I mean, the museum is actually like quite inspiring and I find it quite beautiful, honestly. So I don't know. If no, actually, I wouldn't say it's a critique no. from my side. <laughs> <laughs> I see it as a, I mean, as a three-minute advert mm. for the project that you want to do at the Guggenheim one day, which I hope will happen. <laughs> um, Christian, do you have something? I just would like to say that I think also the this notion of critique maybe really has changed fundamentally because uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, this sort of uh, fundamental critique uh, was maybe very important to make certain modes of of power relations visible at first. Now we know all about these uh, power relations that are at work when, when we look at institutions and thanks to institutional critique all these layers have been sort of addressed I think. And But of course as, as Jens said uh, artists and all cultural practitioners just move on and we can build up on this knowledge. The interesting point for me now is uh, how to rethink a certain, well, a sort of a notion of critique, also in a broader sense. I mean, when we look at uh, at contemporary uh, theory produced, let's say uh, you all might know the um, the Multitude book or Empire book by Negri and Hart, where they state uh, that this sort of classical critique inside inside versus outside is not possible anymore for a number of good reasons. <laughs> so things have to work within one certain structure and there will not be this one big conflict, uh, there will be lots of micro conflicts. And I think what's, what can be a really crucial point when th in thinking about institutions related to, to art practices is how this a notion of uh, criticality can be worked into a lot of layers inside the institutions. And architecture is one of them and within architecture there are a lot of, lot of uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, fringes, edges, where you can work in these sort of uh, left open zones, uh, not closing uh, certain elements that uh, have become naturalized in the process of the last centuries, like the white cube or like the enclosed neutral mm -hmm. space. So, but, but I think there is a lot of, lot of layers where, where this sort of um, uh, leaving gaps open or creating uh, elements with the potential of creating friction can be a topic, and I think that's really um, that could be a critical, important notion for institutions within art, also on a bigger level. I think it could be interesting to imagine uh, also a big museum trying to apply uh, certain critical maneuvers, certain shifts, certain gaps at each level of, of their workings. Um, and on to maybe the last sort of formal. Uh, false question that I have. Um, the artist Jorge Pardo in 1994 
echoed uh, curator Seth Siegelau from the latter 1960s when he said that the real battleground for art is no longer the gallery, but the printed publication, the monograph, the magazine, and now the internet, perhaps. As the proliferation of representations rendered the gallery as simply a reliquary of fiscal investment, where things are given prices, photographed and sold, and ultimately enshrined in larger museum collections. Um, Jens, um, it, I know you've been sort of hinting this throughout the whole evening. It's uh, the proliferation <coughs> of kind of practices that don't rely on, on the gallery. Um, on the on the sort of back burner of that, do you think that has contributed to a kind of um, uh, what I would perhaps characterize as, as the sort of the, the gallery is primarily a kind of shop, um, and I don't mean that the shop only in financial value, but also cultural value. It's the, the place where the thing might gain accrue cultural significance, perhaps, in a big collection. Would you comment on that? Well, I think we find ourselves at this moment in time, really, um, within the art world, at a point where there's basically an overproduction of, um, of, of art, in my opinion. And um, uh, it, not only an overproduction of art, maybe an overproduction of museum buildings, maybe an overproduction of exhibitions, of biennials, of panels. Um, and uh, it makes it very difficult to somehow um, really find the focus and see which direction we are actually heading with all of this. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that obviously, of course, what has happened in the, inside the gallery space in relation to what has happened outside in terms of artistic activity and things that we have seen outside the gallery space and the longing to maybe break out of the four walls of the gallery space, the, the, uh, the certainly profited from, from each other. So, um, but I, I wouldn't be able to really say what, what the next steps are, are going to be or where, where we are heading with all of this. Sarah, as someone who prior to your um, uh, directorship at the storefront was working, working in publication, mm -hmm. particularly architectural monography, how do you um, position that relationship, let's say, between um, the, the sort of significance of a project uh, when it appears in your gallery and when it appears in print? Um, are, they, are they merely reciprocated or um, does one ultimately, uh, could do one do away with the other, do you think? I don't know, I almost think of it in, when I worked in, in publishing, it was more there were a lot of bad books, there are a lot of bad exhibitions. <laughs> I mean, it's very rare people are actually taking risks to create, whether it's on all sides. I mean, I, I'm just very specifically about architectural monographs. They tend to be, I think, vanity and kind of unnecessary. I mean, they're, they're even approached that way sometimes. I mean, I think there are, there are very interesting forms they can take, but I think that as an industry, publishing, they're also taking much fewer risks. They think that they're going to produce something profitable by doing a book on, you know, new houses in the Hamptons or something. But in a way, if you actually just really did a good book, it, it probably would sell. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that I don't know if that really answers your question. I don't. I don't think that that they uh, cancel out one another. Mm -hmm. That a good exhibition doesn't need a cat. I mean, in a way, I think that it, it's great to have something in print. To, to keep something in an exhibition. I mean, there may be especially um, uh, untraditional exhibitions kind of alive, to have some kind of memory of it, uh, so it doesn't disappear. But I think that there are a lot, I think I agree that there's an overproduction of almost Everything. all of these. <laughs> um, David, in terms of uh, where you position your practice mm -hmm. as, a, as, as an artist, well, I, I wouldn't be that radical as Jorge Parra, like physical spaces all over, mm -hmm. you know, now we all do like publication and things. I mean, I would just see, a, you know, maybe it was also like the moment, like the end of the 90s when he said that, mm -hmm. and, and there was like a sort of, uh, also kind of transformation of how we see like public thing through internet and, you know, like websites and things, and, and it kind of you had the feeling also that, you know, it was less physical than than what we actually were, but I think that's also a little bit gone. You know, for me now, the sort of, sort of comeback of physicality in a way. I mean, we've seen great projects in, in great physical spaces, like the weather project of Olafur Harrison. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I, 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 f 
for my practice, I see one, um, I try to keep an end on, on publication and an end on physical space because I, I do believe they're both interesting for me. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would never exclude one of the two, it's too much. And, and actually, I, I like, you know, like maybe CDs and music as well, <laughs> like something, I don't know, it's, uh, it's a way of making things too, you know, cubicle and, and it's nice to keep it open and, mm -hmm. and be challenged by other mediums. Christian, do you, as, a, as an architect who could potentially now have a, a fruitful career designing wonderful new art, in, uh, contemporary art institutions for various, uh, various people, do you work, does it, uh, it con concern you, does it bother you, does it probably stimulate you that art practice kind of is moving outside, and has it of course moved outside the art gallery increasingly over the last 30 years? Um. I, would, I think I would doubt that it really has moved out. I'm not sure. Um, of course, this notion of uh, the media uh, and the publications is a very important one in communicating uh, what happens within exhibitions and institutions. But uh, um, in the end, there never have been more museums, there never have been more institutions working in contemporary art right now in certain places, in, in certain uh, cities. Uh, all over the world. I mean, uh, it's it's sort of an additional layer, I think, in the end. And uh, I think it's it's also one of those complex layers that uh, form an institution. And I think it it has a in the end uh, maybe the same level of meaning as, as architecture has to to form uh, the the quality and I don't know the character of a certain institution. And it's. Publishing is, is one level uh, of communicating, but I think in the end that's really also uh, maybe an, an important point for for, um, for a discourse on where contemporary art is going. I mean, it can really be, could, might really be a, a sort of laboratory where it's about mm, certain forms of communication and also conflict that is played out on different levels. And architecture is one level to work with, and publishing and media, of course, is another level to work with. Mm -hmm. But it's also exactly one sphere where certain, mm, I don't know, shifts or gaps can be produced that question certain conventions about perceiving art, about perceiving space, and therefore it's a possible um, means of critical thinking, discourse, and production. Thank you. Um, perhaps at this, uh, this stage I'd quite like to open uh, it up to the floor. Um, there are a couple of roving mics and um, if you could please say your, your name uh, and, who you, and where you're from, please. Thank you. Question. Uh, hi. Just wait one minute while the mic gets to you, please. Yeah, I, I'm Nick. I'm a, a practicing artist. I'm, I'm just interested in your question, um, your point, Jens, about overproduction and how you quantify that. Well, I just think that the art world is more crowded than it ever was. And um, in, in regards to what, what the amount of exhibitions that are, I mean, just probably tonight, there are probably five other events we all could have gone to in London related to the art index, whether or not there are openings or other panel discussions or book presentations and so on, which, um, you know, is on any given day in London, the situation. And I think this is not something that is only specific for, for, for this city, but you know, for, for the way the, the art world in the moment functions in general. Right, okay, because I mean, I just find it quite interesting. I'm slightly sort of worried that um, you were asked earlier on in the evening the kind of question about the balance between the, um, the artist, the curator, and the architect. Um, you kind of, I felt you wanted to suggest that the, that the artist was, in fact, sort of in the driving seat to a certain extent. Um, but. I'm not sure, I mean, how often you're in a position as a, as a curator where you've got a shortlist and you're thinking, oh, I really haven't got enough artists on my shortlist here for this show I'm trying to put together. Um, it seems to me that there are huge numbers of artists in, in relation to the number of curators available. And um, the, the, the balance that we're trying to kind of achieve here um, and some kind of equilibrium um, isn't necessarily going to happen unless you end up, ironically, with more curators, more spaces. 
but I don't know if it's, it's necessary to find an, a balance there, if that's really uh, going to solve uh, any of the problems. Right, so you, I mean, I, I know that you, you kind of are interested in that um, balance of, of power, essentially, and that's what kind of what the show is. It's, well. it's more audience interest in contemporary art than ever was before, I believe. Therefore, there's a, there's a demand for things, you know? It's like, if you look at the people who go to the museum now, like, it's a huge amount, and well, I remember like- Tate Modern is the number one tourist yeah, spot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like even in Paris, you see buses arriving, you know, it's or even when you arrive in, in Waterloo, there's like one side of like a like publicity boy giving, handing you the tail, and the other one is such a gallery, you know, like, no, come here, come here, and that's like you're in the middle of the things, and I, I mean, for me, that's unbelievable. It's, it's mass tourism almost towards contemporary art. So I, I, I think all the scales are completely changed. I think I also don't mean to seem so cynical when I say that there's too much being produced or there are bad books and there's bad exhibition. I mean, I think that, because I'm works. actually very, <laughs> well, no, but, but, I th but I think also, and, I, and maybe it's that I, I work in an institution that started, you know, when I was nine or something. I am also starting to believe much more in like what a generation does, not only to change existing institutions, but to create new ones. And that's kind of my new also my new focus is that I think that there's like new forms necessary. So I think that there's a lot of stuff being produced within this kind of formulas or they're, you know, they're not changing so radically the, the, um, the, the format. And I think actually that there's kind of needed as a new format with a new, I new ideas of, of, of what's necessary. Not that we need another, you know, Miami Basel or LA Basel or, <laughs> you know, but that there may, there's also room, I think, not only just to be critical of these established institutions, but to create new ones. Brian, could you pass the mic? Um, in your discussion, it seems to me that, unless I missed something right at the beginning, for which I apologize, that I didn't really hear a very strong distinction being brought out as between the museum and the showroom or show hall. Um, in Germany, the distinction is fairly clear between Kunsthalle and Kunstmuseum. The point being that the museum has an entirely different uh, duty towards curation <coughs> uh, from the show hall, which must maintain a con continuous flow of new shows. <coughs> Uh, the curator in the museum, in a sense, his first purpose is actually not to innovate, if possible. It is to find the definitive form of, of history and to represent it. Therefore, um, the museum of, uh, the architect of the museum is bound to be different from the museum of a show hall. And it seems to me that these uh, two things haven't really been quite clarified. There is, of course, a crisis in the museum in the sense that history's just got longer and longer and longer, and it keeps on getting longer. Um, and if you think of that as a gallery, like in the Louvre, a very long, long gallery, it just keeps getting longer. There's clearly a crisis about the notion of a unit uh, of institution. Um, the Tate Gallery at Bankside is about as big as it's ever gonna get, and then you're gonna have to do something different. Uh, but I still think uh, what you mentioned I think is absolutely right I just <coughs> I just uh, would guess that um, the difference is becoming uh, smaller and smaller because uh, when you think of a museum of let's say maybe contemporary art uh, of which uh, there are more and more and there will be more and more I guess um, the way they work does not necessarily have to be very different from a Kunsthalle because uh, as we see also see in the Tate, uh, there are specially selected exhibitions from a huge collection. So, um, I mean, of course, this is also a question uh, towards the difficulty of uh, collecting contemporary art today, which is not, not as, uh, I don't know, uh, mm, easily uh, to handle as, as it was as it was before, because the formats change, the media totally changes, 
and it does not work with a simple storage system anymore. Uh, but anyway, the trend is here uh, very clearly that uh, there will be certain topics that will be picked out of a huge collection and put into, let's say, contemporary I display. Don't, I don't think that, um, that answers the problem because in the end the museum is precisely that, uh, that, that collection from which you make your selections. And architecturally there is a place which, where that has to happen. It's one thing to say, oh, let's have a historical focus on the late work of Raphael and the inception of mannerism or whatever. Uh, it's quite another to have a hi the history of art represented in a standing permanent collection and to represent that history as history, that is to say as a shape in time, as George Cooper called it. And that must be the, 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 the telos of the museum. Um, when you come to do some kind of special thematic uh, or tendentious show, that's quite another matter. Um, there are practicalities around that which are quite different. Well, I, I just read from, from the undertone that there is a certain notion about, let, let's say, something like authenticity or, some, or the real or the right presentation of historical art. I think these notions, as we've seen in the last centuries, they are very much uh, thought about. There is huge struggle about the right w ways to present also historical art. There are very different uh, ways in which uh, these historical formations can be read. There are very different ways in which they can be displayed. And we see it uh, especially in, in, in museum studies or studies of uh, displays in museums which proliferated in the last 10 to 20 years that it's a very uh, really thought about topic and there is I would say, um, I would dare to say, no clear, definite way uh, how to deal with it architectonically, and and uh, and especially these uh, these um, exhibitions that have a certain focus on a certain period, which interpret, um, let's say, one certain period or a certain artist. Um, they are they are very important uh, means in the in the workings, in the in representational politics of a museum. And therefore, architecture also has to deal with it. The whole institution has to deal with it, and the public discourse has to deal with it. I think it's a uh, question that is uh, open for, for arguments. But I think it, you can, could not uh, burn it down to one model of historical representation that also has to be applied in an ever same I'm mode. not saying that there's one model of historical representation, but there is such a thing as the necessity for a model of historical representation. And it doesn't make sense to propose such a model unless you suppose, presuppose, that it is a permanent, uh, a permanence. That is to say, uh, things may come and things may go, but some things have to stay there. Um, you can you know, have uh, uh, controversial shows or whatever, but somebody sometime has to make the decision to keep something or throw it away. And that's the role of the museum. And then if it's going to display it, then it has to display it in such a way that it is the permanent representation of the idea of history. But it'll but change. The, the work itself is the, is the thing that remains. The attitude tor towards it, I mean, there are decisions made, and this is how we're going to hang the permanent collection, and that's, you know, in our generation, if we're ever in control, we'll have a different, maybe, you know, or future generations, a different attitude towards the work, and it'll be hung in a different way. I went to the Caravaggio show this morning. I think it's being probably hung in a very different way, but it is the same work. It's a very contemporary show. Okay, well, okay, then the, I also went to the permanent collection, and it has changed. The National, the National Gallery's attitude towards that work has changed. Attitude towards how you, I mean, there's a precedent in this show, the Lena Bobardi. Okay, perhaps. Yeah. We can. <laughs> Are there any more questions here at, um, at the front? Yeah, please. Question, but just wait for the mic so people at the back can hear, please. Well, I think you can uh, look at these uh, conditions from a Bergsonian way in terms of creative evolution or a Darwinian way in terms of natural selection. And I think that. Um, when you talk about art, I think that the Bergsonian model of creative evolu evolution is much more pertinent. Yes, there is something called a permanent collection, but 
it, it constantly mutates. Things go into storage, things come out. Things that, uh, the, the relations of the work of art to each other changes. We, don't, we no longer think, even, even after the 60s with, um, you know, uh, the work of post-minimalism, and we, we no longer think of an art object as only an art object. We think about the relations and networks of relations that exist between art objects, and that manifests itself in terms of immaterial relations that exist within a primitive collection. So to say that there isn't a mutation in the, um, in the idea of a primitive collection, I think, is not, um, is for my, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, uh, not accurate. Also, there is a mutation in the subjectivity of the observer as well. If you think of Jonathan Crary's and the idea of the techniques of the observer, what he's really talking about in the techniques of the observer is the fact that technologies change observation and they change the, the, the observer as well. And the observer has to keep on changing the, 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 the genealogy of those technologies as they evolve is a, is a manifestation of a changing observer himself who needs new kinds of technologies to observe with. So therefore, you have two conditions. You have a subject, the actual construction of new subjectivities. And especially when you think of, I'll say one more thing, I'm sorry for holding things up, but especially when you think of the earthling or the idea of the construction of global subjectivities that we have to understand in, in the relevance to today, um, the Okwi Enwazor exhibition Documentary 11 is a perfect example of that kind of work manifesting itself where the time zone, I think it's called time zones uh, at the Tate, um, where we saw, uh, for the, you know, we see over and over again the construction of new subjectivities where a kind of domino effect of what is important in the history of art is changing as well. I mean, what, what will art history be? Will it be visual culture? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you should, Bob. You should. Are there any more? Perhaps we'll take one more question. Yeah, uh, John Fawcett, artist. Um, I don't know if this is a question, it's just a kind of, you know, little thoughts. Uh, I think your first kind of non-question of modern or modern, yeah, I think that was, that was it in a way. I think the gallery is obviously like modern, modernist even to the extreme, isn't it, you know, aesthetically. Uh, and I think that says quite a lot about, yeah, what it is. And I think it's also very functional uh, in terms of it just being a neutral space uh, and this idea of kind of transient artists and you know artists have to respond to a place where their crea creations are going to be kind of shown so you know it's, it's a very useful mechanism um, and in terms of this kind of idea of where where is art going it has to leave the gallery that's that's the only place it can go <laughs> uh, on that we're very optimistic then. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. I'd like to thank Jens Hoffman, Sarah Herder, David Fatoki, and uh, Christian Tecker. Thank you very much.